I could not write them again. I really couldn't um, just from an emotional mindset, just from that. And I, I'm also realizing that, you know, I love those books and I needed to write them at the time. Uh, they were really cathartic at the time. But I'm also realizing that life as a writer, if this is going to be our profession, it's not just about what you want to write. It's about what you want to talk about for five years. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Young Eager Writers podcast. We have a guest today. I am Desiree Brown. This is Michael Evans. And then with us, we have Jackie Castle. Um, before I pass it to either of them, I want to give my little like personal introduction, which is Jackie's awesome. And she's been awesome <laughs> since day one. Um, she has spoken at the Young Eager Writers Conference the past, like, I think three years, if I'm correct. Um, super, super cool to see her in action. Um, I just, I love the way that she brings an atmosphere to life. And that's something that I'm very excited to share with all of our listeners and viewers today. Um, but I will pass it off to Michael real quick to do a proper introduction for Jackie. Yes. So Jackie Castle is an educator and novelist living and writing in the Blue Ridge Mountains near Asheville, North Carolina. Castle has been published in a variety of publications, including Mountain Express, WNC Woman, Asheville Grit, and Explore Asheville. Her novel, The Seclusion, which School Library Journal called a must-have for all libraries and fans of sci-fi, garnered Castle the title of 2020 indie author of the year through the Indie Author Project, a collaboration between Library Journal and Biblioboard. Castle has taught creative writing workshops through the Carolina Mountains Literary Festival, Indie Author Project, the Writing Heights Writers Conference, and this fall will begin teaching through the Great Smokies Writing Program. When not writing, Jackie can be found hanging out with her family and consuming far too much caffeine. <laughs> this is all just what, what a wealth of knowledge and experience you have. Super excited to chat with you today. Thank you both for having me. It's such an honor. Um, and to see, I've seen Desiree a little bit on the, in the virtual world. And Michael, I don't think we've seen each other in a couple years. So it's nice to see you again. And always happy to chat with you all. Yeah. Yeah. It's always, always so much fun. I mean, I feel like whenever I see in my inbox an email from Jackie, I'm like, oh, it's Jackie. <laughs> I get to hear from her again. So. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. Well, back at you. We we love to start off uh, with super fun question, which is, what is your origin story? Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting origin story because I am not someone, especially talking to the Young Writers Association, um, I was not someone who started writing creatively at a young age. Um, so I began writing nonfiction, you know, in the form of journalism and freelance writing uh, in college, just kind of as a way to make money on the side uh, while I was going through school. And then I kind of found that I had a knack for it. Um, so I was actually a professional journalist for a long time before I was an author. And I did not write my first fictional work until um, The Seclusion was my first piece of fiction that I ever wrote. Um, and so that was very interesting, kind of going from the mindset of always, you know, writing articles and uh, business websites and journalism to then, you know, transitioning to fiction. I definitely had a lot of having to learn how to show, not tell, um, and just kind of switch that mindset. But as soon as I started writing fiction, I think I wrote that, drafted that novel in about three months, and it was just, I was bit by the bug, and I, I couldn't stop. And wow. um, and so since then, it's become, you know, my life. I had the sequel come out this year, and I'm now uh, back in school getting a graduate degree so that I can begin teaching writing. And so, you know, I just have fallen in love with writing fiction. And I still do the other stuff on the side, because as we know, as writers, you know, the fiction doesn't always pay the bills, but... <laughs> It's lovely to be able to uh, find more of a balance in those types of writing in my life. Yeah, definitely. I I love that you included um, your start with journalism and stuff, because I think that that's something that we don't always think about that can really fuel our um, fiction work. Do you, 
Oh, yeah. Do you see correlation between that? Do you see things that you've learned in journalism that has really helped you in the creative writing world? Absolutely. Um, I think that journalism, especially if you're doing human interest stories, which is a lot of what I did. So I wrote for the Mountain Express for a long time. I did a lot of food and health and wellness and really just kind of covering local businesses. So I think, yeah, you know, when you kind of get out there and just start talking to people, um, learning about human nature, learning about people's motivations and desires and successes, that I'm sure that all comes into play. And then just having, you know, that that base knowledge of grammar and editing and working with people that are gonna kind of rip your work to shreds. <laughs> you know, maybe when you then go into fiction and you're a little more attached to it, you can view that, um, you know, from a less precious place and maybe a less defensive place, which I still, you know, I still had those moments, but I think that going into it, having worked um, with that editorial world already, it gave me kind of an insight. Um, into what that process might look like in fiction. Yeah, I, that's a really, it's a good point because that's something that's really difficult for creative writers to separate themselves from their work. <laughs> like everything is personal. Every comment you get just hits the heart. And it's something that's, I mean, Michael, you can agree or disagree. I'm curious about your thoughts on this as well, but I feel like, I had to really learn that it's it's not about me when it's about the work, but I, I do feel like it is about me. And I see that all the time in writing workshops, people who start off um, as creative writers and probably a lot of our listeners um, who discovered creative writing very early on, it's very difficult to like, no, it's, it's not personal, but it feels personal. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, um... You know, it's you're still going to have those moments when it feels personal and you'll have parts of your story that you're connected to. And I think a lot of it is is that gut feeling. Um, I was talking to someone about this the other day, you know, during a writer's workshop is that, you know, sometimes that feedback that isn't right is just as powerful. So if someone tells you a suggestion for your story and your gut says, no, that's I'm not going to change that like that. That initial reaction is just as powerful as the suggestions that may lead to changes. It just, you know. Being like, okay, I reacted strongly to that. What about my story is important uh, in that moment? Um, and so, yeah, I think that being open to hearing feedback, but then also recognizing that, you know, it's your story and maybe there's a piece of it that you're precious about. And could you tell it differently? Could you tell it in a more efficient way? Uh, so just kind of letting yourself feel those emotions that are, that come up to the surface when someone is evaluating your work and then, you know, digging into that a little more. Yeah. So I think when just feeling like someone's commenting on your work, it's, it's almost like I had this fictional world that I was supposed to rule over. And now you're telling me what to do. Like I'm supposed to be the ruler. And always when people are trying to give you feedback, obviously most of the time, like they, they want to help you like really good feedback. I think the people who are like not giving constructive feedback, uh, all that can be really hurtful. Like, you know, that's not feedback. That's just being mean. But when people give you feedback, they do want to help you write a better story. And ideally, if you write a really good story, you can reach a lot of readers and have, a, you know, full-time living as an author, whatever your dream is. But we, we know that's not always that simple. So for you, especially being an indie author, how have you marketed your books and, and found readers? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I've really tried to um, go the route of just forming connections, uh, whether it's about my specific story or not. So doing things like this, where I'm putting myself in a situation where I'm just chatting with fellow creatives, um, not just kind of preaching about my book, but just talking about writing and getting my name out there, um, you know, always being willing to say yes to a conference or or to something like that. Um, I do do readings, you know, Asheville's a very a very supportive town. So I'm very lucky to have a wonderful, you know, library community and our indie bookstore that's always happy uh, to have me in. Um, I do a podcast as well called the Indie Writer Podcast, which uh, we've been so fortunate enough to have Desiree on. And and so that's great too, because it's it, kind of my secret plot, right? To have a excuse to reach out to people that I just want to geek out with. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's working marvelously. Uh, and so that that's a big thing. Um, 
one thing for my career, which you can see through my bio, was the Indie Author Project was very uh, transformative for me, which was an award that I applied to through um, library. It was through Library Journal and Biblia Board, and so the goal of that organization is to kind of form a bridge between librarians and authors uh, and get more indie books into libraries. So I was fortunate enough to uh, be named their author of the year in 2020, and that opened up a lot of doors for me. So I would recommend that people take a look at that program because uh, in addition to their awards, they also have ways for you to just kind of submit your your ebook um, version of your book for circulation in libraries. And so that's a really wonderful uh, program who has a lot of plans for the future. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of getting into teaching, figuring out, you know, finding your audience, uh, figuring out how to reach them in ways that maybe aren't uh, literary centric. So, you know, I write sci-fi, so I'm happy to go on a, a sci-fi podcast that's maybe not about novels, but it also doesn't have an audience that is getting books sold to them, you know, every single day. And so I'll go on silly rewatch podcasts or just kind of, you know, have fun and be like, where could I find these readers that maybe aren't um, in the traditional, in the traditional space? Yeah, that's something I haven't thought about because I've all I mean I know Michael knows as well both of you you know how much work goes into marketing yourself and marketing your book and I don't you know I don't realize you really have to get creative and I think you've you've done that successfully and how to reach certain readers um and certain audiences and I'm I'm curious to know um just because you mentioned your podcast what's one way that having that platform, like not only are you introduced to new writers, but is there any way that the podcast actually ends up fueling your writing, like within your writing process? Oh, absolutely. Um, and we tend to do a combination of, you know, craft episodes and then also just kind of life as a writer. Uh, so, you know, marketing kind of the, the nitty gritty but always when there's, you know, an episode about world building or something, you know, I, we all get fueled by fellow creative people. And so I will frequently, you know, just leave that podcast with a few ideas and, and just always having community in those ways, especially during the last couple of years when we've all been so isolated, having that to turn back to every few weeks and just chat with my friends um, was really invaluable. I also, you know, have formed a lovely writing community where, you know, we all have flexible work. We're, we're freelancers. We have some time. And so we'll, we have a writing practice where we'll um, get on Zoom almost every weekday and we'll do writing sprints. So we'll write for 20 minutes and then, you know, turn our cameras and our microphone off and then check in and maybe read a little bit of what we wrote and, and bounce ideas off each other. And that has been really fundamental because I'm very, I get distracted very easily. You know, I'm not left to my own <laughs> devices. I don't get things done. And so just to have some folks to be accountable to is really important for me. <laughs> I've heard so many good things about writing sprints, just from writers of all walks of life, that seems to be a superpower. And obviously to like sprint with someone, you have to have someone there. And you were talking earlier about just reaching out to authors and your podcast being an excuse, but like, never mind if I have an excuse, like reaching out to authors is sometimes very intimidating. And especially like being a younger writer, a lot of times, a lot of authors that we might look up to that we might want to chat with are like double or triple our age. And it might be like really easy just to dismiss ourselves and be like, they don't want to talk to a kid. I'm no one. And then if you always do that, you'll never talk to anyone. So what would be your advice to someone who's a bit scared, who doesn't know how to approach their first person, especially, you know, a writer who's specifically younger? Yeah, I think that um, there are a lot of communities online that help. So obviously yours is, is a wonderful, you know, if people wanted to, to meet other creatives within that program and say, hey, let's do some writing sprints. Um, social media is great on Twitter. The writing community often has, you know, sprints that are just kind of on Twitter where they'll be like, all right, five minutes and go. And then everybody checks in um, on the thread. You know, it doesn't have to be on camera if you don't want it to be. But I think, you know, like local libraries also, you know, will sometimes host writing events. Coming up in November, we have National Novel Writing Month. I think that's a really wonderful time to start building out your writing community. If you go on their website, they'll often list local events. So there may just be like a bookstore down the street that's offering um, a write-in. 
And there are certainly tons of virtual write-ins that are listed on their website. So if you don't know where to start, I think that is a wonderful resource that's coming up in just a couple months mm. um, that you can then, you know, stay in touch with those people. You know, if you find yourself around fellow writers, whether it's at a conference, whether it's just at a small class, you know, hold on to them. <laughs> Make sure that you are staying connected because chances are they're feeling the exact same way you are. Um, it can be a very solitary path that we've chosen, which I think many of us love that, but maybe not all the time. And so, yeah, building that community is is really wonderful. And I, I assure that any listeners that reached out to Desiree and, and Michael, that you all would help them uh, find those members as well. And so things like this, uh, where you're finding communities that are already set up, are a great way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, just because I wholeheartedly believe in that, I have to echo that because, um, you know, I, I, I wasn't secretly a writer or anything. I was very open about, you know, I'm a creative writer. This is what I do. But it was rare that I would come across people who I felt that I could like share my work with. And so that's something that's so important when you find those people that you trust that have the same mission as you that want to advance your work improve your work god it's so so beneficial it is so great to to have that and that's something i've been trying recently to incorporate into my own writing routine because a lot of the time we think you got to sit down for 4 hours you know and just write and but creatively like I just don't always flow like that I I get mm -hmm. so much more out of having someone there just like you said keeping me accountable and saying we're gonna write for 10 minutes I'm watching you yeah <laughs> well it's amazing when you have that timer I I know everyone works differently but but for me having that timer knowing it's about to go off and hey that's the time I can get a snack that's the time I can check my email or you know whatever you're checking I, I'm able to focus a lot more knowing, okay, a break is coming. Uh, and there are times I'll write just as much in a nine minute sprint as I would have sitting there for an hour by myself, just because, you know, we're keeping each other motivated and, and having those folks to be like, oh, I, I, you know, I, I wrote this scene and something about it's not working. And then maybe just talking through it for a minute. So finding those people, um, yeah, I can't recommend that enough. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think it's just if you can incorporate it into even your weekly schedule, I just think it it is it's so beneficial. I've I've found it to be so beneficial. Um, but then again, I my writing routine is more different. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. I don't sit for hours and write. Um, so be, Michael and I talk about kind of our our writing routines a little bit on this podcast. That's another question I would love to ask you is, is there anything different about your writing routine that you would recommend for people to try? Yeah, I feel like a lot of the writing advice is just, it's never going to be a one size fits all. You know, I think that the advice of like, write every day, you know, it just doesn't work for everyone. Um, some people are really seasonal with their creativity and they have long periods of hibernation and like incubating. And then they have long periods of <laughs> of of writing and getting words on the page. And, and that's okay. Like taking a long walk and letting a story ruminate is part of the process. So don't beat yourself up. Um, you know, I think that for me, making sure that I'm, you know, setting myself deadlines where, you know, and really loose deadlines, but, you know, just kind of giving myself little mileposts to get to. So if I'm drafting something, then I want to, you know, I want to get to, uh, you know, from the A to the B within, you know, a couple of weeks. And so just kind of figuring out a way to, to pace yourself. If you are able to get a little extra done, then, you know, go easy on yourself the next day. Remember to go outside and take walks and pet the dog and do all that <laughs> stuff that keeps us like, and then, yeah, but I, I don't, my routine has definitely become more um, disciplined in that, you know, I'm able to commit hours every single day to writing, but I recognize that's, you know, a, a privilege that I have and not everyone is able to do that. Uh, a few tools that have helped me is really embracing um, transcription. 
So recently, mm. if I'm driving and I have an idea, I'll just turn my voice recorder on um, and I'll, I'll kind of tell myself the story. Or if there's a plot point that I'm stuck on, that helps a lot to just kind of get in my character's head and, and just try to talk through it. Um, and so that's one thing. And during National Novel Writing Month, which I try to participate in every year, it's been such a big change for getting those words out <laughs> is to use one of those, you know, transcribe services and just kind of get your thoughts down. Um, I will mention too, if you don't have time to sprint with people or have in person, like even just, you know, make sure you and your friends are on a Google chat, like just have those people where you can be like, it was kind of a hard day writing. How are you all mm. doing? Like just that you can check in with. Yeah. I love that. I, I love that. And I love that you said that you're just hibernating. That's right. I'm just hibernating. I'm not writing right now. <laughs> I'm going to use that from now on. There's stuff going on. Yeah. I know. Yeah. But, but I think we do get that way. Yeah. yeah. You know, where we beat ourselves up because we're not constantly productive. And so much of that is our society. And it's like, we don't have to be constantly productive. That's not, that's not how a lot of people work. And some do, you know, but I know that I need those times where, you know, I've been really... Um, you know, I've really gotten a lot of words out and then I just need to sit with it for a little while. Yeah. I love that. I've literally been like taking notes about what you're saying and like the word like hibernation and how you're describing even like transcription software, all this fantastic advice. And one question I have is as you've gone throughout your journey, what would be kind of like maybe one mistake or one thing that like you, mm -hmm. you wish you had learned earlier? Just maybe people often try to force themselves to be a type of writer that they aren't, mm. if that makes sense. So I am definitely a pantser. I've realized that about myself. Um, I tend to figure out the story as I'm writing, even if I have a few mile posts that I'm like, I, I know I want to get here. I'm very uh, image driven with a new story. So I'll often have a really strong image of a scene in my head um, and maybe another scene, but I don't know how they connect yet. Uh, and for a very long time, I tried to force myself to outline before I started a project or I'd force myself to be like, all right, I got to figure out this plot, um, you know, plot hole before I write. And it just took me a long time to realize I don't work that way. I figure it out by writing through it. Mm. And so by not sitting at the computer, by not writing through it, because I was afraid of some wasted words or some wasted pages, I was really making it a lot harder on myself. So to figure out those, I just have to sit down. I have to write through it. Even if some of that's going to get thrown in the trash, it's going to be easier. Um, so that's big. Another thing is kind of in a similar vein is, is not being so precious about your words, like be willing to let them shift and change. Um, I remember reading, I'm sure a lot of us have read on writing, you know, Stephen King's <laughs> book. But one thing that stuck with me was that, you know, we change as people. If you wrote a story six months ago and you go back to it, you're a different person. Like mm. you're, there's a lot that's happened to you. Um, there's a lot that's happened to your views in the world. And it's okay to um, to be like, this doesn't quite fit. And, to, and I think that we get in trouble as writers when you're like, oh, but if I cut this, then it goes from 50,000 words to 45. And I just, no, I can't do that. When really just kind of yeah. setting it aside and writing that scene again, would probably be so much more natural um, and save you time and frustration. And so that's one thing that I do if a project isn't working is I'll kind of skim it, I'll set it aside and I'll try to write it again. Mm -hmm. um, and usually it will come out more naturally. The pieces that were important to me are the ones that'll stick and the rest will kind of just fall away. And so not fighting that uh, has been a really big thing that I've tried to do. I, I think I'm having like a brain blast from... <laughs> This conversation because mm -hmm. that and and uh, Michael I'll I'll pass it to you next because I want to hear what your thoughts are on this but as a young writer I love that you're talking about you know knowing what kind of writer you are and not forcing yourself to be a certain kind of writer because I think that's something I just recently had a realization with actually a conversation with my partner I've been so serious about, I want to write fiction. I got to write fiction. I, I got to write this amazing story. I have all these ideas. And he turned to me and was like, I feel like you're more of a poet. And I was like, mm. but, but people don't care about poetry. You know, he's my insecurities talking. So 
it's just so reassuring to hear someone else say that, to say, you know, whatever writer you are, that's the writer you are. Um, yeah, uh, Michael, I just, I wanted to ask you too, what you thought about that. Cause you've talked about kind of looking back at work that you've written when you were younger and now being different and having different viewpoints, all that stuff. So. Yeah, no, that's, it resonates with me a lot. Cause I think I, for the longest time had this tendency to kind of look at my old work and just never feel like it was good enough. And I always wanted to go back and change it. And I, and I would then find myself reading it, but then also not knowing quite what to change without just throwing the whole thing away. Mm -hmm. Cause none of it felt quite right anymore, but it was actually in a similar vein, listening to a podcast where Emily um, St. John Mandel was talking about her book, Sea of Tranquility and how after having a, a child, how her kind of writing changed because Station Eleven was this very pandemic, dystopian novel, 99% of the population is dead. And then, you know, fast forward, Sea of Tranquility isn't as dystopian. Like it, it's still like futuristic, it's um, science fiction, but it's set where a, a writer is coming from the moon to tour Earth. It's a great book. I recommend people reading it. I think she's a fantastic writer. But she said, if I was to like write a dystopian book now, like I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that because recently I've kind of had a new revelation, not just looking back at old work, but thinking about the work that I am writing and how my writing is evolving. And I always kind of felt the pressure to kind of fit to a genre. Like, well, I am a dystopian writer. I write kind of apocalyptic fiction, but I recently have kind of started to really want to feel proud with a newer identity and and what you're saying jackie's helping me because i think like emily i couldn't write a dystopian novel at this stage in my life maybe 10 years from now i will be able to and that's cool but i don't want to let this kind of mess of who i think i can be as a writer stop me from actually writing what i need to today and, and i think this is something that i've actually really struggled with during the pandemic because I was not able to write a dystopian novel during the pandemic, which meant me not writing for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I resonate with that. I mean, I could, you know, the seclusion and the chasm are both very dystopian. They're very near future dystopian and very politically driven. And I could not write them again. I really couldn't um, just from an emotional mindset, just from that. And I, I'm also realizing that, you know, I love those books and I needed to write them at the time. Uh, they were really cathartic at the time. But I'm also realizing that life as a writer, if this is going to be our profession, it's not just about what you want to write. It's about what you want to talk about for five years. Yeah. And so, you know, also being like, okay, what, what literary worlds do I want to be in? What other authors do I want to be in conversation with? Um, and things like that. And so I think, Michael, it's a really good point that it's like, this just might not be the season for dystopia for you. But that doesn't mean in, in 10, 20 years that you're not going to feel drawn to it in a different way again. Um, but yeah, just go with whatever's fueling you. I think authors are really, um, I think a lot of that genre stuff is getting blurred in the most beautiful way in that, you know, that um, people are really drawn to, you know, you'll have people that follow you because they like your dystopian novels and you'll have people that follow you because they like your writing voice and they're going to read anything that you write and it doesn't matter, you know, how it fits and you might have some dystopian themes and, you know, whatever fantasy or sci-fi or any other thing that you write. Um, but it may not be as um, front heavy. I mean, I've recently been writing like sci-fi body horror. So it's just, um, yeah, totally different <laughs> stuff, but just having such a blast with it. <laughs> I apologize for that. that is. There was like a noise. Oh, I didn't even hear it. <laughs> oh, you're good. Oh, okay. I'm curious what sci-fi body horror is, because I actually have never heard of that. I've heard of a lot of niche things in sci-fi. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it's like kind of a lighter dystopian novel that I'm writing right now that takes place um, in a futuristic world where the sun has become too strong for people to be out during the day. Hmm. Uh, so people kind of live nocturnally. Uh, but then there's also, you know, secret society that is kind of playing with like bioluminescence and eye shine and people. And so someone ends up there and their body basically just kind of starts changing without their permission really and so it's about her journey and what that's like um and so a lot of like kind of body dysmorphia um things in there right. and and that's been so fun to play with and and more surrealist kind of vision dream style writing i've been i've been really enjoying so i'm um, we'll see where it goes the first draft's almost done so hopefully i'll have an update next time <laughs> 
I love body horror now. That's <laughs> incredible. Really, like I now want to read that. That's right. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Well, and if you just that... look up body horror, it's like its own genre of horror. But I don't think a lot of people have really put that into other genres, which it's I'm just powerful. enjoying. Yeah. Yeah, that's such what a blend. I love that sci-fi body horror. That's that's really cool. And as you're kind of writing this, you know, much I don't want to say the word um, like evolve evolves it as you're kind of your fiction's evolving. It's also really interesting when people are starting to first write. Uh, we always kind of view our own writing, like people might get in through fan fiction, which is literally like kind of in the vein of another author. And other times it kind of just feels like, is this my work yet? Like, I don't know what me is. So what would be your advice to someone kind of trying to first find their voice as a writer? And how has your kind of voice evolved over time? Yeah, that's a really good question. And first, I'll just say that I, I think fan fiction is totally legit. Um, I think that if it's what gets you to love writing, gets you to explore worlds, um, then that's awesome. Like, love to fan fiction. So I think so many writers enter through that because it does feel kind of safe as a playground to explore your writing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to know. I haven't written so many books that I'm seeing, you know, a definitive thread. But I think it, it is figuring out, okay, what have I written? What are the themes that keep popping up? Maybe, you know, Michael, it may be that, you know, maybe dystopia isn't where all your stuff falls, but everything plays with um, hierarchy or class or, you know, that there's themes that show up in your work. Um, and I've noticed that with mine, there's a lot of themes where misinformation is something I'm always very um, interested in. Um, you know, science versus nature and where people kind of twist those lines I'm always interested in. And so there are these themes that have been in each of my work. I enjoy writing very rich sensory stuff. Um, so that's kind of stuck around. I enjoy writing people who maybe are really disconnected from their bodies and then suddenly have to face themselves a little bit more than they have in the past. Um, and so I think those things will continue to be a theme in my work. Um, one tool that has helped me a lot in just figuring out my voice, and this sounds really silly because it's a little too on the nose, is just reading everything out loud. Mm. Uh, does it feel natural for you to read it? Like, does it feel like something, like a story you would tell someone if you were sitting in front of a fire? Um, like, does it flow? Um, or does it feel really stilted and like you're forcing it? I think that has been a really good tool. So if a chapter just isn't clicking, then I will often um, be like, I'm going to try to read this as if it's not my work um, and just see how it feels. Yeah. Or imagine that I'm reading this publicly in the future and just like, am I, does this seem natural or does it feel like I'm lost in 5,000 metaphors and it doesn't make any <laughs> sense to anybody that's not in my head. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's one of my tricks. And I can't say like, oh, I've nailed my writing voice. It's never going to change. I've found it because I don't think I'm there yet. But I think that I am figuring out um, what pieces of of um, my work I am passionate about and will probably continue to play with in different forms. Mm -hmm. That's that's really great. I'm going to take I'm going to take a note of that, because when I teach creative writing, I have Sometimes I have no clue how to express like, this is how you strengthen your voice because it's such an abstract, personalized thing. Um, and I read out loud all the time. So I already tell my students to do that, but I'm definitely going to start giving them that advice to be like, just read your work out loud as if it as if it wasn't mm -hmm. your own. So I think that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, which is hard to do. And I think the... Um... Yeah, I don't know how to ever, for anyone to be like, oh, I found my writing voice. Like your writing voice you hope is going to change and evolve. And it is such an abstract concept where it's like, you know, you hope you hope that it changes and evolves. And you hope that you look at your first novel 30 years down the road and it's not the best thing you've ever written because you've become a better writer. And you, you know, and so that's a good thing. You know, don't look at any past work with shame. Look at it as like, wow, you know, this was a seed to who, you know, the writer that I became. And I never want to think I've arrived because we all have so much more to learn from each other. And so, yeah. yeah. But I think there's a point where it will feel natural, where you'll feel proud to read it, where you'll be like, oh, this, this just clicks. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. 
and read more read like go to virtual readings COVID has made so many like open mics virtual you know get out there if you're afraid to go with people that you you know sometimes it's easier to find a room full of strangers seriously who like don't know your name just Mm -hmm. (laughs) god I couldn't recommend that more I think especially like slam poetry open nights like that where you can just kind of experiment with low stakes is I think really important and can help build your confidence too because like reading aloud to yourself is one thing when you actually get to see other people's reactions is totally another thing and I I think a lot of it is just about feeling confident as a writer is like a huge part of voice is just feeling like that next thought that I have I'm actually going to write it down and I feel like it's very difficult to do that and with that thought to writing thing I wanted to ask about how you got into transcription because like it's just for writers who aren't into transcription yet which I feel like most aren't but a lot a lot are but still most aren't how did you start transcribing your works because it's like I don't know for me it's like head to the fingers but I guess for you it's head to voice I don't know well I will say that it, whatever I transcribe still needs a lot of editing it's not like I stick it in Google transcribe and it's good to go it's more just about getting the the plot out getting that that story out on it, I mean, I'm older than both of you. I, you know, I, I have two children. I drive a lot. Um, and so that was kind of, honestly, it, it kind of just started out of necessity where I'm like, I got to get this this story done. There's a deadline. You know, when I was writing the seclusion, a lot of it was rewritten. And I was like, oh, I've, I'm rewriting a third of this book and it's due in a month. Um, and, you know, so a lot of it was just necessity in that I have kids and I needed to make my commuting time work for me if sometimes that was the only time I had in the day. Um, They're a little older now, so I have a lot more flexibility. But, you know, there was a time where it was like, if I didn't, if I didn't just do it, then it didn't get done. Um, And so that was kind of when I discovered like, oh, I'm driving back from dropping them at school and I have a half hour to myself and, you know, I'm going to lose this thought. So I just started, you know, it started with like, oh, a thought, you know, here and there on a voice recorder and then suddenly I'm like, oh, I don't have to type this out. I can just I can just talk to myself and Google will take care of the rest. <laughs> oh, it's genius. And I think as well for so many people, we have times in our day where we're listening to music or we're listening to a podcast or maybe an audiobook. But we have kind of this space where it's like, well, we're not gonna be talking and listening to something else, but we have something in our ears. So why don't we like we could just spend our time in a story world. You could take out a tape recorder, like you said, while walking, by doing so many things and just get a few words in, keep that momentum going. I I think it's brilliant. And I'm really happy you brought that up with yeah, us. Yeah, I will mention one other tool that I've fallen in love with. So this isn't for drafting, but there is an app called Edit Out Loud. Mm. And what it does is when you're in the editing stage of your story, you can take um, a mic, you know, a, a doc file and you can upload it and it will read it to you. You know, the voice is still kind of robotic, but the genius of it is it's just a few little buttons so you can listen to it while you're driving or walking or whatever. And um, you're listening to your story. And if you have a thought like, oh, I need to change this here, you just hit a button, you record yourself and it adds it into your Word document when you download it at the end as a track change. Mm. And so it's just, it's it's magic. It has changed my editing life in like, okay, I'm going to listen to this on 1.5 speed as I drive, power through this novel and just be like, what plot holes are there? What stands out? Um, that has been a really valuable tool. Right. So I the, recommend that. The time <laughs> that you're probably saving like with that. Yes. <laughs> And if you're beta reading for someone, I've used it many times to beta read for other people mm. where I'm like, I don't really have the time to sit down and read this, you know, 400 page fantasy novel that my friend gave me, but I love him. And so I'm going to make sure to get him some thoughts. And so I'm just going to kind of listen to this and, and record my thoughts as I drive. Um, and it's, yeah. it's really great. Well, not that you haven't already given like so much great advice just within like these minutes, but we do always do a closing question, which is what advice do you specifically have for young writers? Now, you know, I get that maybe this can be kind of a combination of things that you've already said, but we do try to see, is there anything specifically for young writers that, that can help them? Something they can think about when they, they leave here today. Yeah. 
yeah um sorry my cat is just <laughs> all over me um <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, we talked about a lot. I think build your community. Um, You know, don't be afraid to get out there. I would also say that, you know, it's like, don't be afraid to query. Don't be afraid to start putting your work out there. Um, You know, I think I read somewhere that it's something like, you know, between like 40 and 80 no's to a yes. It's like, it's it's a numbers game. It's about uh, putting yourself out there. Start small. Um, But don't be afraid of that. Don't be like, I'm going to wait till I'm. 25 or or whatever your arbitrary thing in your mind is. I think of the one young lady that goes to your stuff, um, Millie Florence, I think, who already has like three novels out (laughs) or something. You know, it's like, just, just do it. You have a unique voice. I think this generation especially has such so many stories to tell um, and people want to hear their stories. And so, yeah, just try to put yourself out there. And if you don't want to put yourself out there to the larger world, then, you know, find the people who you trust, um, Find the people who you respect. Uh, one tool that's helped me a lot is, is sometimes when you're floundering, and this can kind of go back to voice, pick one person that you're writing mm. to. Uh, pick someone that you're like, this person's going to read this story. Um, and it doesn't mean it's about them. It just means that, you know, you kind of come back and be like, I wonder what this person would think of this chapter. And, and would they be excited to read it? And figure out who that person is to you. For me, it's... Um, One of my very first editors who's we've just become each other's beta readers, but I really value his opinion so much. And so he'll still be in my mind sometimes when I'm writing something new, like what would he think Mm -hmm. of this story? And so find those people for you um, to help keep you motivated. I love that. I, I like that. That's something I'm really going to carry with me, like for my next little writing sprint. (laughs) Well, as usual, this was amazing. Amazing. Um, we're going to include any links anywhere to follow you and buy your books in the description. So please everyone check that out. But Jackie, anything in particular um, that you want to say, how people can kind of keep up with you? Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty reachable. I'm on, you know, I'm don't do Facebook, but I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Jay Castle writes on Twitter, uh, Instagram, Jackie Castle writes, you know, my name, first name spelled, strange so just double check the spelling (laughs) on this episode um if you're in western north carolina i will be teaching um starting this fall with the great smokies writing program so if you want to do a you know a course with me i'll be doing a building your writing toolbox 10 week uh semester course this summer so come play um And yeah, I'm always happy to do book clubs. I think the joy of like meeting with people who have already read your story is just so fun. So always keep me in mind for that. Um, And yeah, um, feel free to email me. It's just JackieCastle at Gmail. I like chatting. (laughs) So yeah, thank you both for having me. Of (laughs) course. Well, this was wonderful. Thank you for uh, people who are listening or if you're watching. Um, super exciting. It's funny. We were recording these and these are actually going to be released way in the future. Like I think it's done like one or two months from now, but it is oh, very, that's okay. The national novel writing stuff will make more sense. <laughs> right. Yeah. And people will need that. I'll need to re-listen to this back, back when, when NaNoWriMo is coming up, but thank you all for listening. Um, and we'll see you next time. Bye.